You're listening to Inclusive AF with Jackie Clayton and Katie Van Horn. Hi, Jackie. Hi, Katie. How are you doing? You know, we're recording this on a Monday. I couldn't be better on Super Bowl Monday uh, <laughs> because Taylor won. Taylor won the Super Taylor Bowl. Taylor was the biggest winner. <laughs> yes, actually, she was. Ice Spice was the biggest winner because true, lots true. of people didn't know about Ice Spice. They knew about yes. Taylor. Ice Spice was the biggest winner of the night. That that is true. And actually, Lana Del Rey got some some good love too. So yeah, That's it right. was all around. And then I did see something which actually kind of made me sad. So uh, what is the guy's name, the performer in Las Vegas that is like dark hair, singer? Um, he's been around forever. Wayne Newton. So yes. there was something on like Instagram or TikTok. There was like, oh, all the celebrities at the Super Bowl. And they said that they identified him as like some random person. And I'm like, no, that's Wayne Newton. Like, how? And it made me sad for him. I was like, the guy's been around forever. Um, but you know, alas, what are you going to do? You do um, the best so this, you can. this is the Inclusive AF podcast. Um, and we have a guest with us today that uh, would like to uh, have a great conversation with. We're going to have a great conversation with. So uh, Rolando Talbot, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce yourself and share a little bit about who you are. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for having me here. I'm a big fan. I've listened to you all for a while and, and I, I do appreciate I've, I've done these type of things before and it's always very sort of hoity toity and kind of, I just, I appreciate the dialogue and the conversation without all the pretense. So thank you for having me here and looking forward to our conversation. Um, as I call it, it's, it's my, my origin story. So I'm a, I'm a Southern California native um, and uh, I grew up in the LA area. And um, for me, went to college out here. Uh, I joined the military, joined the Air Force right out of college. And as I started my career and sort of progressing my career is really where this sort of intersection of DEI and the work that I do today kind of came in. Because as I would sit at these tables of all these, you know, very important people and generals and all that type of stuff as a young officer, I look around and I wouldn't see anybody who looked like me. And I began to realize that in these conversations, we were making decisions, oftentimes life and death decisions, about people who did look like me. And I got really just interested in like, how does that happen? <laughs> like, how do yeah. I end up in this room? Um, like, what did I do to get here? Um, and like, why is it that I'm the only person here? And then why is it that there isn't this sense of representation, although I didn't know that's what it was at the time, but just like, why, why was this not sitting well in my soul? Like, what was this? Um, how did it happen both historically and systemically? And so when I left the military, it was really just this intense desire to want to understand that a lot better and, and create situations or environments and where that wasn't the case. Because I know that going through the military, I had a very traumatic experience being those only people and having to speak up and sort of advocate for others in a way where I didn't necessarily have the power, nor really the voice that I do today to have that. And so that's really what kind of just... I would say catapulted me into the DEI space was just really getting interested in how to make that type of change. And so as, as I joined different corporations and did different roles, that's really just how my career sort of progressed um, and, you know, in, in increasing roles and in, in having this type of responsibility. So at the point where I'm at now, I'm in a, a large entertainment company um, leading the diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts of the organization. And that's really my focus is how to create these spaces um, of inclusivity, of it belonging, um, bring voices to the table. I, I often say, and it's not my quote, but I love saying it is, you know, if you don't have a, if you're not at the table, then you're on the menu. And so it's really, how do I get people off that menu and to the table so that we can do this work together? And then along with that, I mean, I really do I'm I'm sort of a believer in this is not just a job, it's a lifestyle. And so I, I do a lot of this work in my community um, from a volunteer um, aspect, uh, whether it's through our educational equity um, efforts. Um, I work with our police in my local city in policing equity. Um, gosh, it's a lot of stuff, not nonprofit type stuff. 
um, that I do. But really, my current inter interest right now, my current focus in my work is is really this desire to bring a lot of intersectionality into the work that I do. So we're in the middle of Black History Month. Um, you know, it feels like we've got 29 days to cram in all the great things about Black people. Um, but but really looking at more of a 365 year year long strategy, but also that intersectionality to say that, hey, there are, um, you know, how do we put the lens on black women? How do we put the lens on black neurodiverse individuals? How do we put the lens on different pockets of, of the community that don't often get uh, that spotlight shown on them and doing that across all dimensions of identity? Uh, so really interested in that right now. I'm a technologist by background. Um, so really looking at the intersection of DEI and technology. So really interested in, in immersive technologies when it comes to DEI um, is something that I'm really kind of into. And then um, also looking at uh, trauma-informed workplaces and how do we sort of take the workplace as we know it today, make it more trauma-informed and looking at the impact that that has on, on the different communities uh, and doing all of that and trying to tie it to uh, the business and, you know, and, and all the fun things that capitalism has in store for us. But other than that, um, I'm married. I have two kids. Um, uh, I've been married to my wife for over 20 years now. Um, uh, and she works as an attorney in our, in our, uh, in our area and two kids that are just amazing. I've got a 15 year old daughter. So we're just getting to that, like talking about college and like, okay, trying to map out where we're going to go and, you know, visit and things like that. And then I've got a 10 year old son uh, who's amazing. He's testing for his black belt in Taekwondo in a couple of weeks. So I'm just really super excited about that. And yeah. And other than that, I, you know, just, just trying to live life the best way I can. Just trying to get through it. Trying to day get through by it. Day. Day by you know, day. I love that every time we have a guest on, it just makes me feel like I'm the laziest human on the planet because all of our guests are like, and I'm also doing, and I'm also I was thinking that I'm about like, you too, Katie, actually, you know, they make yeah, me think you are together. the laziest person every time. No, stop. See, are you kidding? Yeah, and, no. And you forgot to mention, you're also a published author of a children's book. You yeah. Why was that also, not like one of the first three things? Yeah, you know, it's it's yeah, I it, it's it's on the resume. I don't know. <laughs> We're gonna rewrite your bio right now. That's what we'll do for the rest that. of this podcast. We're just. <laughs> well, well, I want, but before that, I had some questions. Oh, love it! I was taking notes. I got new pencils, so I was taking lots of good notes. <laughs> Starting with, we're gonna go all the way back. Why did you join the Air Force? Yeah, so that's a, it's a, I was sort of, as I say, voluntold, I'm a third generation Air Force member. So my mm. father was in Vietnam and my grandfather was in Korea, all in the Air Force. And so it was one of those things where, you know, it was like, oh, this is the family legacy. Uh, I think it was a little bit different for me, as I kind of mentioned in my position being a young officer, you know, it wasn't the easiest time being in the military in, in my particular generation. And so when I look back at my, you know, not that it was easy for my father or my grandfather either, because um, my grandfather went through segregation and my father did as well. But it was more sort of like, can't is does this have to be my legacy as well? Do I have to do 20 years and get out and retire and, and figure out something else? Or can I start that, you know, my own legacy, write my own chapter and story? Uh, as well. So, you know, it was one of those where I just had been ingrained in that culture is the only thing I knew, quite honestly, if I'm being, being honest, I don't, that's all I knew uh, was serving. Um, and, and while I don't discount what I've learned and who and it's made me who I am today, um, a lot of the other work that I do is really helping those young folks who are coming out of active duty, really understand the corporate role that they're walking into. Uh, and, and really help prepare them for whatever that next chapter is in their lives. So I can appreciate that. I I was just really curious because especially it was after college. It wasn't like during or before and you hear about that and, and sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. So I was really curious about mm -hmm. that. And I'm glad that you brought up and this is now I'm jumping all the way in the other direction because it is uh, I was so glad to hear about trauma informed um DEI Bieber like it is Black History Month and I don't think organizations know how traumatic that is 
for a lot of black people. Like, I don't want to, I'm not doing your stuff. I'm not going to participate with you. Like if you don't handle it in a certain way, or it just seems like just, it, we all, all black kids have the same story about when you talked about slavery and history and it, you know, you have this, that alone causes trauma and people don't realize, especially if you're not a member of a, of a particular group, those of us, you know, we're learning secondhand, third hand, trying to get all these things together. And so the intersectionality piece is great, but I uh, appreciated you sharing that and just wanted to make note of that. Oh well, yeah, no, I appreciate it. Absolutely. And, and that's the challenge with it is because it is not widely recognized what we find, and I can speak from my own personal experiences, oftentimes we're forced to have to relive that trauma to help inform others of that trauma. Because you're not in it, you don't know. You don't know me having to recount my entire lineage to prove, you know, my blackness during this month is, is trauma. It's causing trauma. I'm going to do it with a smile, but you're never going to know that, right? And so it's it's how do we how do we stop that? How do we how do well, we inform and stop that and make the place better? But yeah, I I agree with that, and I always say I'm not gonna sell my soul out for your aha moment. I refuse. I don't share any of those personal things except for with my therapist. <laughs> like those are things that I'm gonna reserve for my own healing, not your education. And the the it is so important that we can learn from all all of us, but we did a presentation today for Black History Month and learned more in that hour than any of the education that we had. There's so many things, and this is just one month and we're looking at one particular group. There's so much to learn. I wanted to ask through the your history of all of these different roles, has there ever been a common thread that you think you've had to go over in each new location kind of from scratch? like? Okay, here's the list of things I, I do. Here's a list of things I don't do. Here's the list of things we're not going to do. Like, oh, those uh, are all, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll tell you, the ironic piece about that is that, at least in my in my history, I don't know that I've ever really lasted that long to get through that arc, right? Because I think you, for me, it was very, as I started getting more into this work and learning my own sort of boundaries and kind of what I will and won't do, um, a lot of it was understanding where the organization was at and how much sort of emotional labor I was going to have to put in. Because oftentimes I was one of one or one of a few doing this work. And it was really sort of like, okay, where are we at? So one of the current themes um, that I even see today in the work that I do is really like, hey, can we just all get on the same page as to what diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging to? Like, what, can we just all agree on what these things mean, because oftentimes I've found throughout the course of my career, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to a leader and they'll go, oh, my God, we are so diverse. I don't even know why you're here. And I'm like, OK, tell me more about it. Well, we've got her and him. And it's right. like, you know, and it's like, OK, like, let's let's dial it back a little bit. Let's have these conversations about what this means or, you know. Um, yeah, I, I, hey, I'm in, I'm inclusive, you know, I make sure everybody's invited to the meetings. And it's like, no, that's not what that means, right? And so I think a lot of what I'm very interested, especially in entering new organizations is one is what's the propensity for change? Like, how are they really, really about this change? Or is it just like, where is it coming from? And, the, and you know, there's different ways to sort of learn how, where the, the truth lies. Um, but then it's also it's like, hey, can we can we level set here for a second and get on the same page as to what the this means and really build that foundation of here's where these terms mean, here's how it shows up, here's how it affects the business, and then building on top of it. So I'd say probably throughout the course of my career doing this now close to 20 years, that has always been fundamental is, is I have yet to go into an organization that truly understands what these things mean and are looking at it from a, a more systemic change perspective as opposed to, well, hey, my competition's doing it. So I, you know, or, you know, we're in a moment post George Floyd, everybody's doing it, you know, I've got to do it or whatever that is. And so, you know, usually when I get to that point where I'm like, oh, you, you sounded, you said all the right things, but now I'm not seeing the money there or I'm not seeing the leadership commitment there. You know, it's kind of it's that decision matrix, right? It's like, do I continue in this work or is it or have I hit my guardrails and you're not really interested in continuing this journey with me and I got to move on. So 
well, that's usually how it ends up playing out. Yeah, I love what you just said about just defining what does diversity, equity, and inclusion mean? Because I think there's also the whole layer in the political um, pieces of it, and then also the complete misinformation that people are getting and how this topic has been politicized in such a way that it's like, no, that's not what it means. And no, that's not what anyone is trying to do. So just the fact that, you know, it is that going back to the very basic of what are we actually talking about here? What are we actually trying to, uh, how are we trying to define these things? Because I think it, that is such a basic tenet of this work, but I don't think folks sometimes stop to do that um, and getting on the same page is such a critical piece. So I, I love that you call that out. No, absolutely. And I think that's part of the challenge too, is I meet, I meet some really well-intentioned folks who are like, hey, you know, yes, I get it. I want to do this. And, you know, they're doing so many things and it's hard to say, okay, let's reel that back in a little bit and let's talk about really what the impact is here. What are you trying to do? Are you causing more harm in your, all those type of things. And that's a tough conversation to have, especially for those who are sort of super motivated in this work to say like, hey, let's take a moment out. Let's, let's chill. Let's re-educate ourselves on this. Let's get on the same page and then let's move forward. And oftentimes that there's a lot of resistance to that. Um, whether it's, you know, the 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 naming of just DEI in general and it feeling, you know, sticky and icky uh, as it is now to just doing the work and just, you know, how are we funded? Where are we putting our money? All that stuff is, is you know, it's what I spend most of my days having conversations on, it feels like, so. Yeah, Jackie's in Texas and I'm in Arizona, so we can completely appreciate yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Bailey. <laughs> I think, you know, in, in, in one of the things that it's like it's saying there's people that are well-intentioned, but I always feel it's like diet where it's like, you know, I had sugar snap peas for dinner last night. I'm healthy. Like, that's all I have to do. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I walk to the mailbox, I exercise. Mm -hmm. And then when you get down to it, like, do you want to make a life change or do you want to make this investment or are two different, different things? And some people do have that push back, but I think a lot of it has to do with people haven't broken down, not just the definition of diversity, but it's like, what is what is inequitable right now? Where do people not feel like they belong? They don't take all of the other initials. Like, let's just look at another initial today. Let's see where we're at and putting all those things together. And, but you're right. It's like, people are all over the place. It's a, they're in a different place in their journey. And I haven't met one organization that had a propensity for change. I mean, like, even like, we're going to change the corporate font. Like people fall out when they're like, don't use Comic Sans. Like yeah. people will literally die on that hill. When you but also don't use Comic Sans, just so we're all on <laughs> Perfect, perfect, perfect. Yeah, you know, and, and so that's where I, I sort of like that challenge in a lot of ways, unless it's it becomes, you know, untenable. But I like that challenge. And that's where I sort of leverage my own sort of intersectionalities to sort of you know, bring different approaches, bring different strategies to it to get folks to understand, you know, that yes, there's this business case for DEI, but then there's also this morality case for DEI. And it it's it if you say who you say you are, if you really do mean that, then this is just another piece of it. This isn't something that that is meant to um, you know, change you in a fundamental way that you are no longer recognizable to yourself. This is this is who you say you are. So let's put your money where your mouth is. And so it's usually when I'm when I'm trying to approach things from that sort of perspective, that oftentimes for some leaders, there's this aha moment and it's like, oh, okay, you're not trying to whatever, um, put a bunch of women in leadership positions because it looks right. It's like, no, this is actually here's the case study, here's the data, here's how we're going to do it. Um, this is what you're talking about and all the materials that you put out there to clients. This is what makes sense. Let's move forward and let's get this done. And so th there seems to be some success when you approach it that way. But but I think to your earlier point, yeah, you know, there's, there's no organization that, you know, if it ain't broke, you know, why are we trying to fix it, right? If we're making profits and we're able to lay off people and keep revenue up high and keep stockholders happy, why are we going to, you know, put together a more inclusive hiring strategy? Like, why would we do that? All right. I think that's the piece that always is interesting when I'm working with organizations is, is that exact thing of that, like, 
helping them to understand, and, and I won't call it a business case because it's, it is that, but it isn't that it's more just the, like informing them of what are the business reasons why this is important. But also to your point, it's, again, it's not about, I'm going to change who you are or your belief system. I'm going to change the behaviors that you have while you're at work. And, and I think that's another piece that people get very stuck on is, oh, you're trying to you know, make me vote a certain way or make me believe a certain thing. And, and it's like, no, I, these are just how we're going to work together, how we're going to actually achieve things. But I think it also goes back to the earlier point of this informed trauma and like how you actually deal with that and focus on that in such a way that people understand. For example, the Black History Month, you know, that you just mentioned, how does that actually impact all of your employees that identifies black? How does that, it, or anyone that identifies as a person of color, because there is, there are those stories pretty much within every culture that, that they can say, oh yes, I was also traumatized, you know, or I come from a country that was colonized by the British or whatever it might be. And so you have just these, uh, these traumas that come up all the time. And it is, how do we define these things? How do we think about the moral application of them? And then also how do we start to build a space that is, we aren't just saying is inclusive. We aren't just saying, oh, we're going to check these boxes, but truly is. So I think that's just another piece that, um, that comes up all the time, but I don't think people understand all of the different nuances that kind of come into play when you say, Hey, we need to do this because it's the right thing to do for the business or for any reason. No, absolutely. And I guess going back to the books, I totally forgot to mention the books, but that, that was kind of the reason why I started writing the books. I actually have two books. I'm working on a third, but the first book was more about just, um, I come from a multicultural, multi-ethnic background, and, and that's reflected in my family. So it was really this intention to say, hey, this new generation, what are we calling them, alphas now or whatever, whatever this newest generation is, you know, it sounds cheesy, but right, they're going to take this work forward and what we realize when we look at technology and we look at sort of the connectedness, they they are this new generation is more technologically advanced and connected than my generation was in the ones before it. Um, and and why can't that be the same in this space too? Right? Is why can't my children who are growing up already be equity minded? They don't have to be taught this later in corporate life, right? They're just going to grow up with this equity minded sort of sense of self. And that was really the impetus of sort of writing the book was was like, hey, there's all different types of families. There's all different types of backgrounds. You're unique because of your particular makeup, but so is everybody else. And it was really just an exploration in that. And then as my daughter got older and she started to experience microaggressions in school, I was like, oh, we need something for, for her age. We need something for that area to understand here's what we go through that may seem very subtle, um, but again, causes trauma. And how do we change that? And so I wrote a book specifically around microaggressions for sort of that generation as well. So, I mean, the idea is, is just that by the time my children and that generation get to where I'm at now, th hopefully we have made some changes and, and it is more of a... Um, sort of a ubiquitous sense, if you will, of, of equity in these type of things, because they, they grew up hearing that from, from the stars. So that, that's the whole idea behind the books. Well, I mean, and in talking about that, yeah. like it is, it, I, I, my kids are older than your kids. My kids are about to be 22 and 24. I don't even know when that happened, but there wasn't a lot of books for them and then i ended up giving them books later one was for my oldest that was like big hair don't care because my oldest has the biggest hair you've ever seen it's just big and i used to like not want anybody to see it and they didn't have those kids books and then there was another one for my son my son was born and he just is unique looking and was just compare themselves to other people but the fact of the matter is is that especially if you're not teaching these things in schools people it, like conveniently forget that the whole reason why we started seeing more black history in schools was and why they de desegregated schools when you look at brown versus board of education had to do with the psychological study that kids that 
were, were asked, the doll test, uh, did you, which one's the better doll? Is it the black one or the, or the white one? And they realized that we weren't giving people these opportunities to see success from their own race and culture. Now we're going back to that. And the trauma, the, the, the overall impact that people like to turn away from is from just not learning your basic history. And, you know, I, it'd be great if we could pick every every day to be, you know, Black History Month or, you know, Black History Day, and we have all these things. But what it should remind people is that we are not getting everything from our from our education, and we're going to have to do the work ourselves. And just going in like all of us that are DEI practitioners have to go in with the mindset that I don't know everything. And I want to keep learning from you. I want to learn and, and learn as much as I can to take that attitude because it's not like teaching someone how to use Excel, right? Where it's like, okay, this is a pivot table and this is a this and now you're done and you can get your certification. It's not like that. It's very nuanced. And so you bring a lot to the table when you're, you've talked about the intersectionality and, you know, people with multiple cultural backgrounds within the books. I'm so glad it's going to take more of those types of books that children can read because they're not getting the education in school. So Yeah, I, I love that. And, you know, that's part of the reason why I do what I do in my community as well, because I, I've also recognized, you know, there's people that are well-versed in this type of work, but their, their, their labor only goes to corporations. Their labor only goes to those areas that that aren't really going to make that change that we're talking about. And so it's that recognition that, hey, we need those in our school districts. We need those in our police force. We need those in our communities. We need that level of skill um, uh, there as well. I can't be everywhere and it's not that great on my mental health, but you know, I'm doing what I can to, to, to be where I can, but that you're absolutely right. Is it's, that's what it's going to take to sort of combat this, this trend of sort of reeling all this stuff back. And, you know, it's just funny you bring up the, you know, desegregation because right. It wasn't that long ago. I work with was it? Who, who were, who, you know, and so it's like, when you think about that, it's like, it's it's like oh okay this is just bringing back all the things that were there not that long ago and we're just kind of repeating this history so it's like let's be smarter than this and not just sit back and wait till this happens and it's across the board we're seeing it with lgbtq community we're seeing it with women's health rights like it's it's scary and ridiculous you know and here we go we're in an election year so we know that 2024 should is going to be interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's the word I'm choosing to use today. Yeah, interesting. it is definitely causing us to sort of prepare and sort of think about it. But again, I, I go back to that community aspect. It's like, how do we mobilize locally within our communities in this work as well? Uh, and again, kind of taking it out of the boardrooms and, and the corporations where it needs to be, but also infusing that in our, you know, our local politicians, our local laws, um, that are happening that are inequitable or taking away our rights. It's like, how do we stand up there as well? I think that's a piece that, you know, it, it, I, all I'm thinking about right now is, you know, it, you both said this, like the education piece in schools right now, we know that there is such a challenge to even sharing history and, and what actually has happened. And, you know, this being Black History Month and as kids learn about slavery and the trauma that, um, black children go through during, you know, that learning. And yet we're trying to say, oh no, it's actually traumatic for the the white kids. So we can't talk about this. There isn't <laughs> a thought of, hey, you know, the trauma that we're going through by talking about this as, you know, oh, these people were considered less than, or they, you know, this happened or whatever it might be. And how that has has touched so many people. And yet the the concern right now is, well, we don't want to hurt the feelings of the white kids and we don't want them to feel bad about themselves. And so there is just this weird, you know, logic to all of it as well. But I love the idea that you're saying. I think, you know, Jackie and I both are uh, very much into the kind of the grassroots and the community and how can we talk to folks and share with politicians and share with our local uh, folks in charge uh, what's important to us. And I think that's just such a critical piece. And um, we'll start saying it now because I think we're at that point where everyone needs to be registering to vote. So 
go vote, go register to vote, I should say at this point, go register to vote. Um, but when you think about, you know, a person going into an organization that maybe doesn't have the 20 years of experience that you have doing this work, what are the things that you would recommend, you know, that someone does that maybe is like a leader of HR or that is recruiting or, you know, the, the folks that maybe are leading a small team and are frontline leaders, things like that? Yeah, definitely. So I think part of what I, I always tell leaders, uh, especially who are kind of new to this or new to their roles, is you got to get out and start, you know, reaching out to those infrastructures and those resources that can bring that knowledge in. I think there's a hesitancy um, at least in a lot of the the folks that I work with to sort of, well, I don't, you know, not every resource is created equal. There's so many out there. I don't know who to go to, or I'm going to go to the top four consulting areas and in the DEI space because they, you know, I'm going to pay them a ton of money, but they're, they're the voice and authority that I know of. And, and so part of that is really getting down and doing your research and understanding the culture that you're in, because not, you know, not, not every size, you know, is going to fit your particular organization. Um, and then I think there's also a certain level of humility um, that one has to have. I think you forget who said it earlier, but it's like sometimes we don't know what we don't know. And it's and it's sort of recognizing that, you know, there's nobody's expecting you to be the sort of the expert in all of this, but we do expect you to be the expert in figuring out how to get this done. And I think that's part of, um, uh, you know, uh, how this works sort of progresses. One thing that I tell people very seriously, and I'm, I'm very, very serious with this, is, you know, when they go and they look for consultants and things like that, I'm like, if, if look at their boards, look at the look at diversity of their boards, particularly just for me, what I advise is, how do they position Black women? Is it is it is it somebody at the top? Have they been there for just three months? Have they rotated a lot? look at that bake up, understand kind of what you're getting yourself into. And if you don't see that representation, if you don't see that change, that's your red flag. You may not know all, all the ins and outs, but that's a flag that you need to look at is, is how do they position this work? I have worked with organizations where, and again, well-intentioned people, but if your entire board is white and there's no intersectionality, there's no diversity within it, and you're in the DEI space, I'm questioning what exactly are we doing here, right? How how exactly are we positioning this organization to come in and help? And so that's really, you know, how I start, um, you know, helping these organizations start to put together those foundations if I'm not in that particular position, but simply helping out. Well, and along with that, it's it's do the research of the people that are there. Like, is this somebody that should be on the board? You I mean, you have to, you know, do your math because it's not just about optics, right? Like Absolutely. there are plenty of people who optically look a certain way. And that was always the challenge when you first started, when in my lifetime, a Gen Xers, um, like when you saw people starting to get more leadership positions, but they were, they still had the same pedigree as everyone else, right? Mm -hmm. Like they still, graduated from Yale or went to a top prep school or lived in these communities and had different things. So it was like, okay, what is this person offering to the table? Are they looking at other people with the experience that maybe they don't have that same pedigree? Are they looking at all of those things? And, and what are they doing to try to, to get that? Because the other thing that we're seeing now is people are done being only like, I'm just not, you know, I always say I volunteer as tribute, but it's like, what have you done up to this point? Cause some people are like, I see, and I appreciate you asking me, but I'm not doing that. I'm not going to be tokenized or be your only one. So dig deeper. I love that. I love that. I'm looking at Katie is talking to her dogs. Can you hear? No, no, I just can read lips really. Mailman's good. here. It's a problem. Mailman's trying to get us. <laughs> I say that all of the time too with my dogs, but I, you know, you do the best that you can. Um, one of the things that you had brought up was about bringing, bringing voices to the table. How can someone, you know, what is a good way? Because you want to enable people to feel confident enough and create an environment where people feel um, like they can share, but you also don't want to put somebody on the spot. Like maybe there's a reason Marsha hasn't said anything during this meeting because she's going through something else, you know, where you, you know, so how can you safely bring voices out that may not have been 
heard and may have experienced that it's not a, a good place for them to speak up. Oh, for sure. So, yeah, I mean, it sounds a lot simpler than, than it is when simply saying if you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu. But that is where, at least in the work that I do, that's where I sort of leverage the privilege that I have within the organizations to reach back out to those thought leaders, to those idea generators and bring them along with me on that journey. So if I'm if I'm privileged enough to be part of those conversations, I'm reaching back out to those to those groups to say, what do you all think about these type of things? Let me let me be that catalyst to to elevate. And then it's less about me. It's saying, hey, I've reached out to this group. They've got some really great ideas to move the business forward. You need to hear it directly from them, though, because I'm not going to do it justice. And I've got them sitting there right with me. One of the things that I love in my current role that I'm doing right now is we have a uh, a mentorship program, but it's it's a it's a mentorship aligned with um uh, those historically excluded or actively marginalized groups, right? So we're bringing in women, we're bringing in vets, we're bringing in Black and African American, we're bringing in those of the AAPI community to, to partner and mentor with senior executives to say, hey, I may not understand your perspective, but you're going to sit in that room and we're going to have these offline conversations and you're going to educate me, right? And that is that is a ton of psychological safety work that has to be built up. It's a ton ton of educational work as to what are some of those, again, historical traumas of, of being the only or the one of one, but it's understanding and it's helping, you know, in my case, executives understand the privilege and, that they have to sit in those rooms and sit at that table and then bringing those voices along. And then I just, I really just, you know, I model that behavior for them a lot of times. So it's like, hey, I'm going to bring one of our hourly workers with us because you know what? They said something that I didn't even consider here. I'm being humble as a DEI pr practitioner. Here's something I didn't consider. Um, this happened recently when we were talking about ways, better ways to communicate to all our employees and, you know, emails, all the technologies, right? The Slack, the teams and everything like that. And I was just casually having a conversation with uh, some of our hourly workers, because again, that's that touch point, and they go, I "I'm working all day. I don't have time to check email." Yeah, I don't. I don't. I, what is Teams? What is Slack? And it's like it's such a you know aha moment. But when you're working, you know, you've got those blinders on. You're like, "Yeah, how would this ever get to you?" Right? But again, it's not just me going into a meeting with executives and going, "Hey." How are our, it's like, hey, no, I'm going to bring in this individual because they've got a really great idea on how to communicate better with our hourly workers. And then that's how we, and then leveraging really our employee resource groups to be that catalyst, to be that sort of entity is really something that um, I'm really proud of in the work that I've done over the past couple of years is to, again, bring that group with me. Hey, you're coming along with me. We're not just going to leverage you when it's Black History Month and we want to know something cool to do, right? It's like, no, how are you actually going to affect the business? Hey, do you want to increase sales with the African-American population? Here's how we're going to do that because of these ideas that are, and then obviously compensating them, you know, not just using their free intellectual labor, but obviously compensating and rewarding them for that. So, you know, but that, it, it sounds simple but but that's years <laughs> that's years of work that's years of conversation that's years of modeling that behavior um so it's not a it's not an easy thing by any means well and i, I would also say it's years of building trust with the folks that you are bringing because it probably is scary for them when you're say hey come talk to the ceo or hey come talk to the entire leadership team or whatever so they are trusting in you that you're going to keep them safe in that situation if they are saying, hey, this doesn't work for us or, hey, you know, all of these things. So it's building trust. But it's also, I think, the, the key, and Jackie and I talk about this all the time, listening. You know, you're going out to folks and saying, is this working? Are you getting the messages that we're trying to share with you? Are you getting, you know, what you need from us? And then listening to the responses and taking action from there. Because I think that's a, so, and I, have been guilty of this. I'll, I am willing to admit it that it's the, you know, you start getting in the group and to your point, you're in meetings, you're in whatever. And so you're like, oh, you just make a decision. This is what we're going to do for the employees. And then you're like, wait a minute, is this truly what the employees need or want or would be helpful and supportive of them? But slowing down and doing that, it's such a critical piece, especially in this work. But I think just 
in any piece of culture and engagement at a company, the listening and making sure and checking back in and uh, did I hear this right? All of those things. Um, and I love the idea of just bringing them into the meeting with you so they can. Right. You, you, rem me. you reminded me of this story when I first started in this role that I was, I, you know, sometimes things, I just think of things. I'm like, yeah, why wouldn't you do that? But, you know, apparently they're like revolutionary. Right. And so I just was like, oh, so when's a good night for me to work overnight? And they're like, what do you mean work overnight? And I said, well, we have employees who work from like 11 p.m. to 8 a.m. in the morning. Like, how do we know what they think if we don't work overnight? And it was like, why would you do that? Because <laughs> that's where they're at. Like, you know, I want to work overnight to to get to know them and to hear from. Them. And it's just stuff like that where it's like, really? Like, that's that's OK. Good point. Revolutionary. Like, it's like, okay, this is where we're starting. Nobody thought of working overnight to hear from our overnight employees. Okay, well, let's do yeah. that. Let's get in. And what are we going to learn? We're going to learn so much from these employees who, who already feel like there's not that safety because nobody ever listens to what they've got to say. And so it's stuff like that where it's just like, okay, um, let's do this. Let me, let me bring you in. I'm going to show, share with you and show you that, that, um, I, I at least care that you're here, you know, that you exist. And, and I want to understand how you see about these things. And, you know, again, it's, it's, it's all the dimensions, you know, I, I leverage my veteran space to say, Hey, you know, um, in Southern California, we just lost five service people in a helicopter crash. And it's like, Hey, I just want to check in. Oh, well, nobody's checked in on us. Okay. Like, I just want to check in and see how you all are doing. It's not, you know, no agenda, just how are we feeling? Like how I know what it's like to lose somebody in their service. How are you all doing? And it's, and it's things like that, that again, it's, it's not like, it's part of a strategy of mine, but it's like, it's, okay, that's just what empathetic human beings do. And, and, and I'm going to then bring your story of, of experiencing loss when you were in the service to our executives so we can talk about you know what are ways that we can support our veterans it, it's small stuff like that but but somebody's got to do it i guess well but it's another group of that's overlooked like and and that's when it goes back to education and teaching people like there's a reason why we put veterans in this in the deib space because they're often discriminated against and still discriminate discriminated against it's not a box to check like there's a real support that needs to be had mm -hmm. and to know how people are treated and it makes me you know think about like what are what are we doing to support each other as humans at some point it seems like we just got off the rails and it is important to understand the differentiator for what we do at at work and what are we the diversity at work versus DEIB outside of work can look like two different things. And, you know, you do want to be in all the places where people are working, you know, at least to check it out, make sure that you're listening, but then do something with it after you have, yeah. you yeah. know. You're absolutely right. It's this communities that we often overlook and they don't feel that safety. They don't. And then it's critical. We end up missing these critical, critical voices. I'm neurodiverse. The, the percentage of black men who are neurodiverse, or at least are willing to admit it, are so small, yet we have so much to offer in terms of what we bring to the table and how we can improve. But, but nobody's talking to us. Nobody's nobody's reaching out. And it's like, OK, well, then somebody's got to do it. <laughs> somebody's got to reach out to these communities and do it. So it's like I can't be everywhere, but I try to be as many places as it can be. Well, I love that it's also, you've mentioned kind of modeling the behavior, which I think is is another factor that if no one else is doing it, we have to stand up and do it. And and I think that's the piece also that folks maybe miss is like, oh, we're, no one's doing it. Oh, well, I guess we're just not going to do it versus no, we, we need to hear from folks that like there's such a subculture of folks that work overnight and, and it's a completely different world, I feel like, because they are just they have different things going on at home. They have different things going on as to why they're working overnight, whatever it might be. And it is such a fascinating thing when you do get to sit down with them to go, just tell me all the things. Tell me, you know, what's going on? How is your world? Um, whatever it might be. And so I, I like that you're recommending that approach. So I think it's so critical. I've learned so much from that, you know, and, it, and it's, 
as a DEI practitioner, it's almost embarrassing sometimes because it, and it's very humbling because, you know, doing this so long, but doing it from the corporate lens, you, you, you train to forget about these things. I remember I was talking to an employee and we were, at, we were having this conversation. I said, okay, you know, granted, you're not on email. I said, how about, um, you know, how about uh, getting your emails on your phone? Maybe when you're off shift and things like that, he goes, I can't afford a smartphone. Right. It's like, oh, man, even in yeah. trying to think of a solution, I'm not yeah. thinking at that level. Right. And it was just, it was eye opening for me. And it was very humbling because it was like, oh, I need to, I need to get out of this sort of corporatist level of thinking that these are people with all individual stories. I need to understand what, what is it that motivates them? You know, yeah, I know why I'm here. But you're just here trying to survive and make whatever you mm -hmm. can make an hour. We're coming from two different paradigms when it comes to to this work, and I need to understand yours very, very intimately and quickly, or everything I'm doing is 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 only going to cause you more harm. So it's yeah. it's, the, it's that level that it's just you know it's like I need to understand you know those outside of my privilege. I need to understand single parents. I need to under I need to understand all these type of things. Um, and maybe that's my own hyperfixation, but it's like, I got to know all the things because I can't do this work if I'm not informed, if I'm just making assumptions. I don't know. It just, I think that's where as practitioners, we get in a lot of trouble and we sort of harm ourselves in this work when we make these assumptions of like, oh, we're just going to do this because this sounds great. And it's like. What is it? Yeah. Does it help? Well, I, I think the other one, and I actually have this slide in one of the trainings that I do, and it's like the world who who has access to Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. And obviously this became a major you know, factor when people were being sent home from work. Um, and it was, oh, well, I don't have, I need a hotspot or I need you know, something for reliable internet, which again, you know, very similar example where it is like, oh, I didn't even think that that would be something we would need to talk about, but we need to, and we need to make sure that everyone has what they need just to, like you said, survive and get the basics of work done. Um, it's just, it's fascinating. I'll take it one step forward. When I was working in higher education, we were, it was in the middle of the pandemic. What again was an eye opening moment it was that sort of technological equity, right? It's like who has their own laptops versus who doesn't, which of our students have the access. Power was another thing that I just was like, like we don't, we have students that had unreliable power. That's they right. Did not have access to power. It was like, oh, yeah. But then it was also, it was not only the access to technology and those infrastructure services, but it was also how do we use it, right? We were asking students for some of the first time, like, hey, you need to, you know, configure your, you know, your hotspot or configure your Zoom for students who have never used that before. So it was this whole sort of like just understanding technology. We've given you this expensive laptop. We've given you a hotspot. Maybe we've given you a portable generator if you didn't have power security, but like, do you even know how to use it? Like, are we just creating a barrier in our, in our, you know, you know, pat ourselves on the back moment of inclusivity and we're just, we're creating a, a situation where students can't thrive. So it's, it's like, you just learn, you keep learning. I mean, My it's still happening. My husband works for the Waco Independent School District. Somebody stole another kid's laptop. When you're without a laptop, you have to pay two hundred dollars to get a lap to replace it, and so people are stealing people's laptops. And if you're not on TV, you can't prove that somebody stole your laptop. And uh, but so what are you supposed to do? Like mm -hmm. I don't like so I just don't have to go to education, or I'm not allowed to graduate because I can't come up with an extra two hundred dollars. Like we are so far mm -hmm. from getting this right, and. You know, there there's these inequities unless you put yourself in the spaces that we keep iterating over and over. Unless you put yourself, you're not going to know. And P.S., you can do everything right and it's still not go well. <laughs> you can do everything right. And, but somebody's going to be mad that you don't have anybody with red hair on the company picnic flyer. Like, yeah. and you can do everything right. Yeah. So give hey, yourself grace. Hey, gingers need love too. Okay. We need Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Don't, har don't harm the gingers. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Rolando, uh, one of the questions we like to ask folks uh, is uh, what is one thing you want to make sure 
folks hear in this episode that they can take away, that they can implement whatever it is? What is your kind of one either call to action or one thing that you want to make sure people heard? Oh, that's a good question. I, I think right now I'm in this space of sort of, I'm calling it empathetic diversity, equity, and inclusion, because I think what, what I'm seeing is this frustration in my industry. And it's, it's very recognizable and understandable frustration that we're in this moment where we're seeing, you know, senior diversity, equity, and inclusion leaders lose their job. We're seeing them openly attacked on Twitter. We're seeing this backlash of, um, of, of just this push towards equity and inclusion. We're, we're eating ourselves. We're fighting amongst each other. <laughs> I can't believe you said that. I can't believe you support this cause. And, and I see that, you know, you know, in our own communities as DEI practitioners. And, it, and I just, it's, it's, I feel like we've forgotten, in my opinion, the sort of the core of maybe why we got into this work um, um, to begin with. That's why I call it the origin story because I'm a superhero, you know, Marvel fan. Every, every superhero has got their origin story. They didn't just, you know, Superman didn't just show up as Superman, you know, well, that's DC. I was talking about Marvel, but anyway, <laughs> but, you know, so we, we didn't show up that way. Right. We, we went through something that, that, that made us come out the other side as, as these, these champions of DEI. And, and I think we forget that sometimes we forget where we came from. And so I guess that's my big takeaway is I always try to humble myself and remember that origin story. And also remember along with that grace and empathy that there may be other people out there that are just like me that are looking for that same grace and empathy on this journey. And yeah, it's easy for me to sit back and go, you don't recognize your privilege. You're, you, it's easy for me to go and point the finger and everything like that and, and, and not really pay attention to the consequences of doing that. Um, and so it's just, it's just remembering, uh, it's just reminding myself kind of from whence we came and, 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 you know, taking a moment to just appreciate the progress we have made when it, when it feels like there's just so much more to do. You know, when I look at my career, you know, pre George Floyd to now and see kind of what I've been able to do and been able to accomplish. Yeah. It's, it's been slow and it's been excruciatingly frustrating. Um, but when I do have, I just spoke at a panel this past weekend uh, I did two talks on one on inclusivity and the other on authenticity. When I have somebody come up to me and say, I never thought of it like that. I didn't realize what I was doing. I didn't realize how much harm I was causing. And now I'm going to change. It's like, those are the wins and kind of latching on to those and saying, oh, I love that. How can we work together to take this forward? You know, those, those are the moments that I try to hold on to and, and, and kind of, you know, at least fill my cup as <laughs> we're going to this work because it's hard. It's hard, right? We know this, but um, but yeah, I, I think that's the one thing I can just leave is don't forget where you came from. Remember your origin story. Remember your why, and, and approach your work with empathy and grace. Love it, Jackie. What you got? I think I want people to just remember that intersectionality piece. Like, keep mm -hmm. telling these stories, but understand we're not a monolith and there's a lot of different um, places that we identify. And uh, so don't forget that, you know, that there are different places that um, people might need your assistance in, in showing up and then also to be the voice for people that look for the voices that are missing to make sure that everybody's being heard. Mm -hmm. Love it. And I think the the piece that you said in many different ways is just giving people the agency to actually have the choice, to have the ability to learn, to have the ability to say, this is what I need. This would is what would make me feel safe. All of those pieces, because I think that's, you know, we talk about trauma informed work, like the just listening and actually saying, what what can I do? to make this better, to make this safe, to make this okay for you. And how do we actually do that in real life? Um, and you gave some great examples of, of how you do it. So I, I appreciate that. Um, so Rolando, uh, I think we could probably talk for another uh, six to seven hours, but alas, um, our editors make us cut it at a certain time. So <laughs> <laughs> they, they keep us in line. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us. Uh, truly appreciate it. Um, this is Katie Van Horn. And this is Jackie Clayton. Bye. Bye.
We are gathered here today to give you permission to plan the wedding that you want. I'm Jessica Bishop. And I'm Sari Wienerman. And we're the hosts of the Bouquet Toss podcast. Today's couples have to juggle so many things, from family expectations to outdated traditions and what's currently trending. So to make it easier, we're going deep to figure out why we do weddings the way that we do, so you can decide what to keep and what to toss from your wedding day plans. You are cordially invited to subscribe to The Bouquet Toss wherever you get your podcasts or at evergreenpodcast.com. By the power vested in us, we pronounce you free to plan your day your way.